Wow. 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 <laughs> hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Nick. Hello, I'm Sean. This is another interview from our series where we interview songwriters for our company Turnout Recordings. It's actually the name of my upcoming album. <laughs> yeah, that's a sick debut. Release. It's like Wu comma sewage. Period. We're a production mixing and mastering company where we record all the instruments and do all the work to get your song fleshed out. If you want to check us out, go to our website, tearingoutrecordings.com, click the link in the description. But today we have the singer songwriter, Hannah and Davenport, for you. Ah, oh, guys, I gotta go now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> Good hang. Yeah, Hannah, why don't you start by giving me like a little bio, but like a, like a nice bio, like not like, not like read from your website, but just like. <laughs> <laughs> but like a personalized bio? Um, sure. So my name is Hannah Davenport. I uh, was lucky enough to have the privilege to go to school with these two cats um, at FIU. So I got my Bachelor of Arts there and um, it was technically in music business, but I didn't really learn anything about music business while I was there. So pretty much all I did was sing um, and I was in the classical department for a little bit, uh, which I don't talk about. And <laughs> I was mostly in the jazz department. And it was great. I knew nothing about jazz when I got there. And um, I learned enough to, uh, I don't know, to feel like I could go sing and perform afterwards. So um, I've been writing music since I was a teenager. Um, I guess technically I've been writing lyrics since I was a fifth grader, but we also don't talk about that. And since then I've been living in Los Angeles, recently moved to New Jersey, um, I've recently gotten into some immersive theater, which has been really fun. Um, kind of a, a stray away from what I grew up doing. Um, but it's been a really interesting way to collaborate with some dancer, choreographer, friends of mine. And I think that's about it. How do you feel like all of the, cause like, yeah, you've been, you've been in a bunch of musical scenarios from like your like acoustic guitar singing stuff and like jazz and classical and yeah this emerges and like so how do you feel like all of those things uh, affect your or influence your songwriting process and stuff like that? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. It's a tough question. So I guess if we go back to the roots of my like musical beginnings, we'll call it. It's interesting because making up songs and singing has been something I've it's something I've been doing since I was literally a child. As soon as I was old enough to join choir, I knew that's what I wanted to do just because I love singing so much. I could definitely say that, you know, I had a huge advantage once I did get into college. I had no idea what I wanted to study. And I found myself singing in like the ensembles and choirs at University of North Florida, which led me into um, the classical department a bit. And I had no idea about any type of like you know, vocal pedagogy or I just didn't know how to use my voice. So I think that combined with the jazz studies I did at FIU really helped round out how I use my voice. And outside of that, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to say because the music that I write and I, and I struggled with this for a while, actually, especially my, my senior year at FIU. I was kind of struggling to find a balance between what I considered to be my music, which Nick, as you mentioned, is more of this like acoustic guitar singer songwriter stuff and what I was doing in school, which at that time was mostly jazz. And I had a really hard time kind of identifying who I was, whether it was like me talking about myself as a musician or when it came down to my music, I kept, I kept running into this question of like, well, how do I do both? And I never thought I could really marry the two. So I think what has been the most beneficial thing for me is having time away from academia and away from, you know, from lessons because I, I found after a year or two outside of college that like I was finally getting my actual literal voice back. And like what I had been doing in school was like super straining on my voice. And I've also found my figurative voice since then as well. So yeah, I, I think being in that um, cross section and not really knowing exactly like who I, like not being able to pinpoint myself in any one corner was a challenge at the time. But in retrospect, it's kind of helped me define like what I what I want to pursue and what I don't want to pursue in my music. 
Right, yeah. Yeah, actually, last week we were talking to Jacob about that because he's kind of in a similar situation where, like, he is writing... He, he went through all the music school, but um, he writes, like, kind of singer-songwriter music. So it's, it's really interesting to hear about that. It's also interesting to hear, like, the the general consensus of, like, okay, I went to school for this and I realized what I don't want to do now. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that seems to be a common thread among people in music academia or have gone through mm-hmm. music yeah. programs. Like, I think that obviously the benefits of having gone to school for me, for music, was that it gave me a toolbox to pull from. But other than that, um, and I was talking to um, a composer recently about this who was saying, like, in his school, actually, he went to FIU as well, um, Manny, or Emmanuel, I think it was last name, Barrio? That sounds really familiar. I don't, I don't remember him off the top of my head. Okay, yeah, he was, uh, he was at the master's program, and... We ran into each other in Pittsburgh recently and we're talking about FIU's composition program and how so many people in it just kind of did what they were told to do. And, you know, and like, so it's kind of one of those things that if you, if you aren't given a, an avenue to discover your voice, but at least if you have the tools, like that's great. But then it's finding that balance of like, how do I use the tools and not let the tools use me? Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's interesting. Yeah, it's really, I mean, yeah, and Sean and I have been kind of, or at least me, I can't speak, really speak for Sean, but I've been, since graduating jazz school twice, I've gone through this twice where I'm like, oh, I never want to play jazz again. Like, I never want to play a note of jazz. And then, like, I went back, and then the same thing happened, and now I'm again in that state of like, oh, man, I don't want to play jazz anymore. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess it's a part of life. And so, like, through all of your, like, because you mentioned that you started writing songs when you were, like, little. And then you went through all this school. So, like, what, how has your process, like, changed? I mean, that's a huge question that'll take the whole hour or whatever. <laughs> but, yeah, in what ways has, has like, let's say, like, when you first started writing versus, like, like I guess around, because you transferred uh, to FIU. So, I guess, like, let's say, like, beginning, midpoint of FIU, and then, like, closer to now. Like, what are some, like, screenshots, I guess? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's funny because my process is like hilariously undefined and I'm, and like, it, it's, I don't know. It's one of those things that like, I'll talk to people sometimes and they'll be like, oh, like you write music. I want to write music. How do I do it? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I will say that there has been a huge transformation in how I approach writing and in how I think about writing. So when I first got into FIU, I was I don't know. I I think the way I viewed songwriting was like very rigid and it was kind of about like, oh, like, you know, this is the standard form of songwriting. It's intro, verse, chorus, verse, you know, and I was kind of obsessed with the idea of songwriting as like a commodity, right? And being able to sell music. And I really struggled with my relationship with my own music because of that, like I didn't feel a connection to it. And up until that point, and I mean, even really like to a, a degree now, my writing is really like, I just sit down and I'll pick up my guitar and I'll kind of just mess around. Like, I don't, I don't know how to play guitar. I know how to like put my fingers on the strings until I figure out something that I like. And that has never changed. That's always been um, the same. So, you know, I'll say like going through the program at FIU from the beginning to the middle, learning, a, just like being in the jazz program and seeing that like all music doesn't have the same form and it, it's not like super rigid, like soloing to me was like the scariest thing ever. I was like, I don't know how to do this, but it definitely opened up um, a different world for me in terms of, you know, like going in, into whatever I was playing or writing. I didn't feel super locked into it. But that said, by by the time I graduated, I still felt this disconnect. And what I found later on that it came down to was the content I was writing about because I was trying, I was really focused on like, okay, what would be like a catchy song or what, like, what are lyrics that would really like, you know, hit, hit home with people. And I really fell out of love with music when I first moved to LA, I really didn't play guitar or play music for a good like year and a half, probably two years. And actually when COVID hit, I had a chance to finally like sit down and I was fine. I was working part time at that point because of the pandemic. 
and the volunteer thing I was doing, you know, took a pause. So I like had time to actually sit down and process all my emotions. And I think that's where I started developing a new relationship with my music. So this has actually all been very recent that I felt like I've started to find my voice. And I think that the change has been that I've been writing music for myself and not for other people. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Yeah, I feel I feel like that's sort of the the artist journey that you have to kind of find. Like, I feel like as a musician, uh, like most people have these like big pauses of like, well, what do I do? Or like, what? How do I find my voice? Yeah, you mentioned I, uh, a volunteer program out in LA. Yeah. Uh, what, what what was that? Yeah. So I I think as as you both probably know a bit of um, most of my work has been in like arts education nonprofit work. Um, and I, I haven't, I haven't actually focused on a career as a musician in any type or form or shape. So when I was in LA, I was volunteering with an organization called Emerging Arts Leaders of Los Angeles. And they're, they're actually a national organization under Americans for the Arts, I believe. So we were just the LA chapter, but, um, in that role, I was focused on like developing public programming centered around the arts. Nothing too exciting. That's Sounds exciting, important yeah. though. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Sounds very crucial and important to melding the minds of young musicians. Yeah, well, and I, I wish there would have been more of that. So just like a quick, I guess, side tangent away from songwriting itself. The work that I was that I was doing in Los Angeles that really um, like pushed me to actually go to grad school. I was working with an arts education nonprofit that programmed artists and residence programs in low income schools, parks, community centers, juvenile probation centers. And yeah, I think that was probably the most like important and significant work I've done. And a lot of it was visual arts rather than performing arts, but it's crazy to see like that transformation that, that, kids especially go through and then looking back and comparing that to like my own experience with with art so yeah, it's good experience yeah how'd you how'd you get involved with that yeah um so it's kind of a it's one of those things where like there was really no set trajectory of how I got there um when I first got to LA I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life or with my career and I was actually serving at a restaurant for like a year year and a half and that was my my main income and I kept applying for jobs I interviewed for a bunch that I was super interested in and I just kept getting denied and then this uh arts organization for uh, various reasons was in desperate need of a program coordinator and that's how I got involved but then you know it it quickly became something that and I never thought I would get into arts education it was never something I was interested in so that's also been an interesting um, evolution <laughs> that I've gone through. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's how like most of life goes. Is like <laughs> some something happens and you're like, oh, I guess I'm doing this now. Yeah. You know? And sometimes it ends up being cooler. I feel. Yeah. Who are some of your biggest songwriting influences? Mm hmm. So recently, some of my biggest influences have actually been Esperanza Spalding. Her her trajectory away from jazz has been very inspiring and very interesting and I think what I look for when I'm trying to find music that I like vibe to and enjoy is music that I want to sing and pretty much everything that she writes is something I want to sing so she's been really influential um especially her use of melody there's a a songwriter named Joanna Warren I believe she's she's based somewhere out of the UK or Ireland or something I don't really know and she's incredible I think she's She's kind of pushed me to think about how I can write more from my perspective. And she, like, listening to her music inspired me to start writing more about my experiences because she deals with a lot of dark subject matter that um, I never thought was, like, you know, I guess okay to, to write about. So that's been really influential. And I think the last person that I would I would mention is Chris Thiele. Just because everything he does is incredible. And um, I can tell by the smiles on your faces that you both n know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Simon. 
Very slamming. Yeah. <laughs> I guess and interestingly enough, I've actually been incorporating a lot more like poetry into my my practice the last couple years. And John Cage, of all people, has been a huge influence for me because he developed this practice of masostic poetry, um, which if you're familiar with acrostics, those are the poems that uh, they have, yeah, a vertical yeah, it's spine. Like it's like yeah. love, L, O, V, you know, and they each have their own line. And so his method, his method is complicated. I don't, I don't, I don't claim to know uh, or understand all of it, but the crux of it is that, you know, the, he has this spine word that travels down the middle of the words. So you have words on both sides and I've been using that as a practice and as a tool to like kind of redefine how I look at text and read text and perform it. So he's been a big influence for me as well. That's so cool. Yeah, that's killing. On the, on, the, on the topic of that, like, have you ever kind of delved into like songwriting exercises and stuff like that? Like going back to the sort of the academic thing, like, and if you have, like, has it helped you or do you feel like it kind of like boxes you? That's a good question. You know, and I have to say I haven't. I've always been really, really hesitant to like the people that are like, oh, learn how to write a song with me in 10 steps or like, you know, come take this workshop with me. Like that's never, and I'm sure that works for some people. I think everyone needs like their own tools. That's never been something I've been interested in. So, and again, like I said, I can't even describe my own practice in my own um, process. So I think the way that I go about um, songwriting is like very organic and the only, like the only exercise that I can really like vouch for, and I still tell people to this day to do it. When I was in high school and I was learning guitar, I, I was self-taught. So my way of learning and this really expanded like, you know, the chords I could play and the way I, like the way I shaped harmonies and melodies was just going on to ultimateguitartabs.com and finding the songs that I, I really loved and learning how to play them. And th that's the only like exercise, I guess I, I can say I've done. Yeah, I mean, I started the same exact way actually. Really? <laughs> that's the, yeah. yeah, same. <laughs> well, yeah, when I was 13, I got a guitar and I was like, how to play Iron Man or whatever. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, how to play Money by Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah, 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 and then doing it all super wrong and then having to be like, oh no, I have to relearn this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> When, when did you start learning guitar? Um, I started playing guitar when I was 14. My older brother, we're, we're two years apart, so we're always, like growing up especially, I, w I always wanted to be like him, and he learned guitar maybe a year or two before I did. So I really, he's the reason why I learned. I was like, I need to learn how to play guitar so I can be like Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I again, I never really took lessons. I just kind of learned enough to like to provide a, a harmonic pad underneath my voice right. <laughs> but um yeah it, it's uh I I don't really like vibe with any other instrument well so I guess it's a good thing <laughs> no I think that organic process like helps you just play like because then like I feel like for myself if I go through too many like systems I'm just like oh I don't want to do this anymore <laughs> you know and then, so back to the kind of the harmony thing, because I mean, like, since you graduated from music school, you have to take all the theory and history and all that stuff. Did you ever, like, after, especially after you, you left, did you ever go in and, like, transcribe some Esperanza Spalding stuff or, like, like kind of analyze in, in any kind of way? No. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I could say I did because, yeah, that would, I, I feel like that would make me so much more legit. But I hate to put us all into this box here, but I am a vocalist. <laughs> right. And I am a, particularly a vocalist who, I didn't really learn music theory until I got into college. Like I learned very basic music theory and I pretty much nearly failed all my theory classes. So yeah, it was that, that's something that has never resonated with me and that's never been interesting to me, but I do wish I was more interested in it. <laughs> but you know, to, to that point though, I think a way that I have like examined 
songwriting, I guess we'll use Esperanza Spalding as an example. Like I would just put her album 12 Little Spells on repeat and pretty much like learned everything by rote. And so even though I wasn't intentionally trying to break it down and like pinpoint its different elements and you know and like I wasn't really thinking about like like how did she structure this like in the back of my mind there was a lot of influences that I still pulled from it because well and it's funny because recently I sat down and I started writing a song like I was just you know fucking around on my guitar like I just started playing some chords that I liked and I sung a melody I liked and started improvising some lyrics and then I listened back to it a little bit later and I was like shit this is a punch brothers song <laughs> you know so yeah. you i guess that's the downside to not really like knowing exactly what i'm doing or like not breaking apart what my like the people who influence me are doing is that like it's then easy to kind of just absorb that information and not really pinpoint where it's coming from so that's uh that's something i've had to be very aware of <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, like that's how all the jazz musicians, like from like I, I guess I think pre fifties on, that's like how they did it, you know. And even like some of the professors we studied with at FIU, like I know uh, Mike Orta, he he like never like sat. I mean, he did later in life, but like his training was like putting on a chick career record and learn like just like learning everything, you know. Um, and there's just like like the music theory that's taught in music school is just like kind of co- something that some dudes codified like a few decades ago, but it's like. Not, I feel like not the only way. So I'm not like, I, I think it's still valid that you absorb music that way. And like, even if you accidentally write a Punch Brothers song, like you you accidentally did an exercise, you know, like you you like wrote a song in the style of the Punch Brothers, like that's hilarious. Yeah, I mean that's a good way to spin it. That's a good way to spin it. I I suddenly feel better about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. I'm glad this podcast brought someone some kind of joy. Yeah, I would, I would argue that internalization is, like, the best way to do it, as opposed to just, like, formally writing it out and, like, I don't know, being a nerd about it. Like, <laughs> like I, I would argue that, like, internalizing it and just, like, constantly listening to it over and over again is a way better method of learning it. Well, it, and it's interesting. I mean, this reminds me of my senior year when I was studying with Lizanne, you performed the song with me, um, You Are My Everything, the... Oh, yeah. I don't know what to call it. But anyway, I rewrote the lyrics to the standard, You Are My Everything, and I, I rewrote the lyrics to Miles Davis's interpretation of mm. the piece. Yeah, yeah. And I remember as I was writing it, I brought it into a lesson with Lizanne, and I I was like, oh, like, I'll, you know, like, I'll focus, like, I guess I'll put this down like I'll transcribe it and and put it down on paper and she was like what's the point she was like you know she's like unless you're doing that for someone else she's like I and I think she knew me at that point she knew that like a I probably wasn't gonna do that work b I was gonna struggle a lot with it and c like if I even if I did have that paper like it was gonna mean nothing to me other than like look what I did so yeah like I remember she just told me she's like just learn it as best as you can and internalize it and that'll mean way more than having like a a transcription of it you know and I guess that's not the case for everyone but it's definitely the case for me (laughs) I mean I was really good in theory class and I've never used like I've never been like oh I'm gonna use a perfect authentic cadence now (laughs) (laughs) I was never like oh I'm gonna use this sick pickery third. Like no, like I, <laughs> it just kind of came out from yeah, from like what you're saying. Like just like you, you kind of just hear it, you know. So did you ever feel like like some kind of like, I guess for lack of a better word, peer pressure, like to kind of like go this like the the music theory straight path? Do you ever kind of feelings of like pushback while you were studying from like your peers or like the faculty? Not us, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you guys were cool. You were yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. We're- <laughs> <laughs> um. I mean, I think a huge, by the time I got to FIU, a huge focus of mine was just performance. And so it, it there was like this peer pressure in a way to like delve into jazz because it was something, I literally knew nothing about jazz. I mean, 
I also knew nothing about classical music. I don't know why I went to music school, you guys. I just went because I wanted to sing all day. But, you know, like, I, I, I knew nothing about jazz before I started studying with Lizanne. I think just because, like, this is going to sound like such a fucking flex. So I'm sorry. Because I'm naturally talented. I have, like, I have been given a, a voice, you know, and which I'm very thankful for. I never really had to work that hard to use it until I got to school and then it was all about like do this jazz competition or or like learn this like really hard jazz piece and I was like I don't want to do any of that like you know like again I found myself in this weird place where I didn't fit in with the classical musicians I vibed with and loved the jazz musicians but like I didn't feel I didn't feel like I belonged in that category either so yeah there was like a little bit of peer pressure to like go the the straight ahead jazz route and like I didn't really I didn't really feel like I found where I belonged until I actually started my music history for class and we started learning about like contemporary music and I was like this shit's crazy I was like I want to do that and so I actually had a chance to do some of that in LA which has been really cool and then of course Alex and I do a lot of work together he's an electronicist as I think both of you know. Yeah, so that didn't really answer your question. It was a bit of a dive away from your question. Oh, yeah, that answered but, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, like, and there's also this di like dichotomy in school, or a lot of schools where it's like, you're either classical or jazz. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like, you don't have to do it. Yeah, I feel like that's a very school thing though. Yeah. And it was fucked up because I, and by the way, I know I dropped the, dropped the F-bomb here a couple times. I hope that's cool. If not, feel free yeah. to keep it out. Yeah, it's, it's fine. I don't know. <laughs> it's the internet. The internet's even worse. The internet loves the F-bomb. Um, I know what the people want. I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't. I never know what the people want. But yeah, there there was uh, there was a lot of pressure to like fit into one or the other. And it's weird because it's like as cliche as it sounds, it was a little clicky. Oh, do totally. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so... Like doing those like jazz like like doing this jazz competition or like learning this really hard jazz do you do you like look back and you're like oh it's a good thing I did that or are you like yeah no I mean definitely every experience that I've had has been beneficial so even though like because I and I think most of it was really beneficial in the sense that it like built my confidence right I don't know and like any time. Like we were saying earlier, we were saying like life's kind of about like you not really knowing where you're landing and then it just kind of happens, right? Like, yeah, like like life, my, my career, like my experience with music has all very much been that way. Like, oh, like things just happen and kind of shape it and influence it. I will say like I, I was something that I was really encouraged to do was auditioned for the Litchfield Jazz Festival that WDNA hosts. And so like I I did I did well in the first round and in its second round, like Lizanne kept telling me she's like, oh yeah, like vocalists don't normally win this. And I was like, oh okay, like I gotta do something like really you know, I, cause I think for the first round I did There Will Never Be Another You with um, a vocalist uh, that I wrote on, uh, for a Chet Baker solo. Mm -hmm. And it went really well. It was simple. So by the time I got to the second round, I was like, I need to do something like crazy. I need them to think I'm <laughs> awesome. And so like I went in with this really complicated chart that apparently didn't make any sense. And like, it just totally got knocked off course and it was a really bad experience. And um, I think I placed last in that round oh, um and I was competing against like high schoolers so there was like this huge like slap to my ego you know and that was a great learning experience in the sense that like now I know from that experience not to like doubt myself and not to like think that I have to always be changed like sometimes it's okay to just feel good where you're at and not have to mm -hmm force yourself to do something new for the sake of doing something new. Yeah. And something that I've been talking to Sean about a lot recently is like, because like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like about to release this album. And when I was like kind of compiling the songs, I was like, Hmm, this is all like medium tempo, straight eights open, like kind of free stuff. I've talked about this with a few teachers. Like it, it's kind of like your cliches. Is that necessarily a bad thing in this world? Because most people th that are not musicians that I know, 
only listen to playlists. They don't listen to albums all the way through and they're not listening for the journey. They're just like, I want to go to the gym, so I'm going to put gym vibes on. And then they have like 20 tracks that sound like gym vibes, you know? So where do you, how do you, how, how do you feel about, about that? Like, so with the playlist culture, like having like a million of the same kind of songs versus like, oh, I'm going to change it up this time. I mean, you kind of touched on that like right now, but yeah. Yeah. No, and I mean, that's a great question. Like something... So when I look back to like my writing in high school and even my writing when I first got to FIU and, and at the end of FIU, to be honest, like my music all sounded very, very similar. And like, I kind of struggled with that for a while because I was like, damn, like nothing really stands apart from the other. But then like what I've kind of settled into more recently is that like, and this goes back to something I was saying earlier, like I'm... I'm genuinely very, very happy with um, the most recent like album that I've put together that I'm working on because it just, it feels like me and it feels like my voice is being really like portrayed through this music. And so, yeah, like it's been something that I've, I've worried less about. And it's also another thing, like I've been listening, there's, there's an artist called Charlene, and I'm going to pronounce her last name wrong. It's, I think it's Soraya. It's S-O-R-A-I-A. And one of her like albums from like 2011 or 2012 is incredible. She, you know, she like, she uses like this incredible like whistle tones. Her lyrics are beautiful. Um, she has this like really incredible way of like navigating really challenging melodies and so I was like, I was just listening to her album and then halfway through one of her songs like takes you for a total vibe change. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I don't know if I, I don't know if I like that. Like I'm, and I know a lot of like the way we consume music now, like you said, is like, it's not album based. It's like vibe based, right? It's this, like this playlist culture. And I don't know. I, I think like, I, I'm okay settling into the fact that like a lot of my music sounds similar because that's who I am. And if like, I'm not, I'm not trying to like plug myself into that listener. That's like, oh, I'm going to go hit the gym or like, I'm going to, you know, like if someone wants, if someone vibes with my stuff, then like they can, I think there's going to be a consistent, a consistent showing of like what my music is throughout throughout that album and like thinking of it as like a, an ongoing experience rather than like looking at it as the different modules is something I've tried to change in my perception of like albums. Right. On that, how do you feel about like the Spotify kind of thing, like the streaming nowadays and like, the, yeah, do you have any, do you have any, th I don't want to say extreme thoughts, but do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> or qualms. Or qualms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think my qualms are probably the same as like most most songwriters and most musicians in the sense that it's a. I mean, it's very oversaturated, and it's it's kind of tied to everything else. Like you, I don't, I don't think most people go on Spotify to discover new artists. I think most people go on Spotify to listen to music that they already know right? Or like you said, to find a playlist. So I don't know. I, I, you know, so to me, that's a problem. Like it's, it's really not an effective platform for sharing music in my opinion. And then of course, I think the, the commonly shared sentiment, um, is that it just underpays artists. So those are my, my two qualms with it. But other than that, I, I don't really plan on using Spotify, you know, to release my own music. It's somewhere where I go as a consumer. And so I'm, uh, I tend to be pulled towards like SoundCloud and Bandcamp where there is more of a direct support be in connection between the artist and the consumer. Yeah. And there's also like the, the pay what you want thing, which is really nice. Um, and then you can like donate to like funds. Yeah, that's a good point. I feel like band Bandcamp's like really wholesome. Mm -hmm. It's very for the artist. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of this album, what phase are you in, and when can we expect to hear this <laughs> album? 
Yeah, so it's um it's kind of pitiful actually. Um, I recorded this album in February of 2021. So I've just been sitting on these recordings and I'm hoping to release it soon. Uh, I've just been caught up with a bunch of life things. My plan is to release it in the next month. Yeah, mm. I'm gonna go with that. And so I just have some like, really just some like overdubbing and things and like some production stuff to do. But um, at this point I might just release it as is because I really don't care anymore. And I just, earlier this year, I think in March or April, we, one of our friends like suddenly passed away and it occurred to me at like right after this happened, I was like, holy shit. Like I've just been, I've had this music and I've been sitting on it for no reason other than like, I just haven't released it. And like, what is the point of creating music or um, recording music or writing music if you're not actually sharing it at the end of the day? So that's been kind of like this continuous like fire that's been burning and that, um, but I still haven't gotten around to releasing it, but it will be soon. <laughs> but actually what I can do, because I have the raw files, if you guys are interested, I can send you, can send you those. They're like, they're kind of unedited, but yeah, to give you an idea of like what it'll, what it'll be like. Yeah, I'm yeah. down to check it out. Yeah. I'm yeah, to, send it I'm over. It. Sweet, sweet, sweet. I'll do that after this. And then for the, the, the general podcasting, uh, YouTube viewing public, when can they, or where can they expect to find this? You So you said Bandcamp, right? Do you have a, like a thing ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have Bandcamp and SoundCloud. I'll probably be releasing it on both just because I like them both a lot. Um, <laughs> and right now, actually, um, most of my music is on SoundCloud. Because I've, I've kind of gone through and like narrowed down the music that I have posted in the past. Um, so I think what's currently on SoundCloud is like the most representative of where I'm at as a musician. So I'll definitely release there. I'll definitely release at Bandcamp. I believe both are just slash Hannah Davenport Music. And that's spelled H-A-N-A-H-D-A-V-E-N-P-O-R-T Music. This album's going to be released under the name Hannah Strawberry, which... Woo! is my preferred name now, I guess. No, oh, and for, for if you're like listening to this and not watching this, she, she pointed at a strawberry tattoo. <laughs> and it's gonna be titled Conversations by Myself. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's kind of like the Bill Evans thing, but not at all that <laughs> cool. I'll, pu I'll put all the links down and wherever links go that you Sweet. can click on. And yeah. the... <laughs> In the interwebs. Yeah, in the internet void. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ether. And and if I can, I do want to expand a little bit on on this album. Do a little plug. So we recently did a live show, like a house show in Pittsburgh, and I performed part of the album. It is going to have some poetry in addition to the music, which I'm nervous about, but I'm also very excited about. And most of this album really is like dealing with, or I guess like the album itself is how I've dealt with and processed a lot of like my anxiety in the past couple years and like come to terms with like fact that like I am a very anxious person um, and that I have like traumas in my life and in like my parents' lives that like I've never quite dealt with. So I think in a sense, like this album is an experiment of like e expressing and like processing and healing through the act of songwriting. So it's very personal. It's very intimate. And yeah, I'm excited to like finally share it once I get around to it by October. I'm saying by October. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. Yeah. To hear it. I'm, yeah, I'm very excited to hear this. Sweet. Thank you. Do you have, so before we leave, do you have any advice you'd give to any like Maybe, I guess, younger songwriters or newer songwriters that are, like, either, like, kind of starting off or getting better at it, you know? Yeah. Any, any just general tips or things that have changed your life? I would definitely say listen to, first of all, listen to um, Sufjan Stevens. He, when I was very young, he kind of changed my idea of, like, the song structure. And I, I remember listening to, I think it was the Predatory Wasp of whatever the long title of that song is. And I was like, wow, I was like, songs are allowed to be eight minutes long. Yes. So <laughs> definitely find music that kind of pushes you outside of your comfort zone as a songwriter, number one. And number two, everyone has their different processes. Obviously mine is very organic and chaotic 
Um, other people have very like system systematic ways of writing. But I would say like, just don't feel like you have to fit into anything. Just the same as like, you know, when I was a classical and jazz musician, like feeling that, that like tearing of like having to fit into one or the other, find your voice and yeah, duh, you know, don't feel like you have to fit into like the structure that exists already. I think that's, uh, I think that's it. Yeah, thanks for coming, Anna. Yeah, this is an awesome. Thanks for having me. Goodbye. Is that how you say bye? G goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> goodbye.